Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. Let's talk a little bit more about bayonets, and this time, not talking about my butt. So I've talked a fair bit about bayonets now, but let's talk some more because bayonets are really important. And before I start talking about the specific thing that I want to cover in this video, let's just remember that bayonets potentially have killed more people in history than longswords did. Um, now, obviously I've got no way of proving that whatsoever, but I think it's probably a fairly safe um, fact, um, <laughs> new fact, I don't know, imaginary fact, possible fact. Uh, it's, a, it's a likely thing uh, to say. Um, why is that? Well, number one, of course, armies were, generally speaking, much bigger in the industrial age than they were going back into the Middle Ages, for example. Okay, Most medieval armies were 5,000, 10,000. It was rare that they were more than uh, 10 to 15,000. Okay? Whereas, of course, standing armies in the industrial age, for example, the Napoleonic Wars or the US Civil War or whatever, were really, really big. And lots of people, uh, sometimes large numbers of the, uh, large proportion of the populace, for example, if we look at even, you know, World War I or something like that, were involved. Now, were bayonets used that much in the age of firearms? Well, this is something that gets debated around, um, about quite a lot. And I think the basic point to make is that most of the descriptive accounts of warfare in the Napoleonic Wars, the Crimean War, things like the Indian Mutiny, lots of colonial wars, do mention the bayonet a lot. Now, what's interesting to note is very often, and I'll probably make a, a video dedicated just to this topic, um, so that I can move on with the topic I want to cover here, but um, the thing which is really worth noting is that whilst historical accounts often record bayonets being used, there aren't huge numbers of uh, medical accounts of people being killed with bayonets. And these, this has led to historians saying, oh, well, bayonets weren't really used, of course. Most people died from being shot or blown up or obviously disease um, or um, <laughs> cold exposure, things like this. Well, first of all, thing thing to say is, of course, most soldiers who died historically have died of things like um, disease and uh, exposure to the cold. But having said that, of the people who were killed by enemy action, it is true to say, I think, that most of them in the industrial age were probably shot or blown up. However, again, if we read the hist historical accounts, bayonets play a big part. And I think one of the key reasons for that is partly um, because bayonets often discouraged the opponents from fighting. They saw them off. Uh, for example, we see this in the Indian Mutiny. We see many accounts of British soldiers going in with bayonet point um, and either finishing wounded people off, which obviously we wouldn't do in the modern world, but it was done then, or um, just chasing off the enemy from a position and taking the position. Now, that, of course, makes the bayonet a fantastic weapon because they've got single-shot rifles, in fact, exactly like this rifle, which was probably carried in the Indian Mutiny, um, and so they don't have time to reload, that you might shoot one person, bang, and then what are you going to do? You're not going to go, oh, well, I need to take that building just over there, 50 yards over there, but I think what I'll do is I'll just get my ramrod out and I'll start reloading. No, okay? Instead you think, well, I'll go and take that building, ah, and charge him with the bayonet. So, bayonets are incredibly important for taking and holding ground, especially in the age of muzzle-loading guns, which are slower rate of fire. I'm going to move on from that point now because that is part of a much, much bigger point which I will I have covered in the past but I'm going to cover in more detail in the future. The main point I want to talk about is when I showed this um, rifle before with, with its bayonet fixed, a couple of people asked me a very interesting question. They said, "Is why first of all, why is there an offset bayonet? And secondly, is it a disadvantage or is it annoying having an offset blade to the line of your barrel? Well, let's answer the first part of that um, initially. So, here is the barrel with my finger stuck in it, okay? It is very clear that if a bullet is going to come out of there, that the bayonet has to be either one side of it above or below. Well, we can't usually put a bayonet above the barrel of a firearm because it would mean that it would block our line of sight, okay? We could put it below, 
that would work and we'll talk about that in a minute or we could put it to one side or the other if we put it to the left hand side then again we have the issue of it could get in the way of the line of sight because a right-handed person looks along the top and left hand side essentially it might be below the line of sight if you put it to the left hand side but it is pretty much conventional for most bayonets of this period to be mounted to the right hand side of the barrel um, why does it have to be uh, offset as much as it is? Well, quite simply, this is a muzzle loader, okay? So when we pour things down the barrel, pour powder and then ball, um, sometimes with a paper cartridge, well, usually with a paper car cartridge, down, we then have to ram the thing down. Now, you can see very clearly you do not really want a bayonet that's really close to the line of the barrel because you're going to stab yourself in the hand, okay? As it is, I would have to try really, really hard to stab myself in the hand. Now, let's have a look at this bayonet in a little bit more detail. You will notice already, probably as I'm holding it, that it is very slightly off the line as well. It doesn't point forward in a straight line, so that takes it even more out of the line of my ramming hand, okay? So if I'm going up and down and up and down with my hand like this, I'm less likely to spike it on that blade because not only is it offset with the um, socket here, but additionally, they very often have a very slight curve or very slight angle, so they're going away from that line of the barrel. Additionally, there's yet another adaptation for that uh, thing, and you'll notice, let's try and get the focus, the point itself is asymmetrical, and actually it is ground that way. So even the point is as far to that side as possible, and even if I brush against it, it's more likely that my hand's gonna come down on the inside and not go and spike my hand on the end, okay? So this bayonet is really, the design of it is really largely dictated by the fact that we have a muzzle-loading firearm um, and it has to be out of the way of the muzzle-loading action. However, later on, of course, breech loaders came along and when you have a breech loader, it changes how and um, where you can mount the bayonet because, of course, now everything's going on at the back of the firearm and you're opening up the breech, if this was a Snyder for example, opening up the breech, taking a, a cartridge out, ramming it into there, close the breech, percussion cap on, cock, fire. So everything's happening at the back and your um, muzzle is staying pointed towards the enemy, which uh, from a, a bayonet designer's point of view is actually um, advantageous because it gives you more options about how you can mount the bayonet. So ultimately, what came along, this is what we're working around to, is the SMLE, now with my new bayonet, I didn't have one before, so this is a Wilkinson made bayonet dating to uh, 1916, same year as the rifle, the rifle being an infield made one, um, and um, now you can mount it below the, um, the barrel of the gun, because you don't, <laughs> it's really funny doing this with such a short rifle, you, I doubt you can even see that now, no. um, but now you don't have to worry about spiking your hand when you're ramming things down the barrel, because you don't ram things down the barrel anymore. Everything happens at the back end of the rifle, so we can now have a um, bayonet that's mounted in line with the barrel of the gun. Now, people ask, is this uh, awkward having this offset bayonet? Well, I have to be honest with you, I find it a bit awkward, yes. Um, let's just put the SMLE down for a second. Um, I find it takes a bit of getting used to. If you're used to uh, using and training with pole arms, then it is a bit weird. You're used to having the point in line with your shaft, as it were. But if you're thrusting your shaft into an opponent, um, it is a little bit weird having the point of your weapon set off to the side. Having said that, when I first got this, I found it very, very weird, um, but you do just get used to it. You do kind of compensate, and you just get used to the idea that, okay, if I want to thrust you in the camera lens there, instead of pointing my bar barrel towards you, I instead just point the barrel slightly off to the left-hand side, and you start to aim with the bayonet rather than with the muzzle. Um, so it just takes a little bit of um, sort of a difference in the way you perceive your own weapon that you're holding. The other thing to notice as well, um, sorry, to mention as well, is that yes, it would to a certain extent create a lateral um, uh, sort of force because the point of impact is set to the side of the plane of movement. It would indeed reduce penetration, reduce penetrative power slightly. That being said, 
we're not talking about the age of armour here. We're not, generally speaking, even thrusting through mail or gambeson. We're just thrusting through clothes. And bayonets are, with the weight of the musket behind them, um, you know, with an eight or nine pound weapon behind them, they have got easily enough momentum to go through anything you're going to need to go through. And I'll be honest, I think, I don't particularly want to test it because this is an original antique and worth quite a lot of money, um, but I think that this bayonet mounted on this rifle could probably punch through most male shirts and most gambesons. Um, because it is such a stiff triangular blade with such a heavy weapon behind it. It's a weapon the weight of a pole axe uh, with a really small, narrow, long, thin shank at the end, almost like a Roman pilum. Um, so I think that you're going to have no problems going through whatever you want to go through with this type of bayonet. Even more than that, as I've mentioned in many of my videos previously, they had a big problem with over-penetration. And, you know, <laughs> over-penetration is not to, be, um, not to be kind of laughed at, as it were, because if you over-penetrate with your bayonet into someone who's trying to chop your head off with a tulwar or a stab you with an assegai or hit you with another bayonet, if you run someone through and they come all the way up your weapon, there's a large chance that at that point you're now stuck into their body. You can't really defend yourself with your weapon because you can't move it around because it's stuck in their body and they're trying to hit you. At that point all you can really do is grab your butt and um, push as hard as you can I guess to push them away hopefully with the muzzle here because they're unlikely to go beyond the muzzle as a kind of natural stop. But that is a long way, that is far more penetration than we really need. That links back to the SMLE. This was really the last long bayonet um, issued to British forces. Even um, very, very soon after World War I, they were already looking at shorter bayonets. So funnily enough, the bayonet that came before this was shorter. It was a dagger, double-edged, the Lee Metford um, 1888 pattern, uh, double-edged bayonet, and then the 1903, which had the same blade but was adapted to fit on the SMLE, have a double-edged blade of, uh, I believe it's around 10 inches, something like that. This is cons considerably longer, um, and the reason they put an especially long bayonet on this was to um, kind of compensate for the shortness of the rifle. So there was a mentality, and again, I'll talk about this in a future video, but there was a mentality certainly at the beginning of the First World War, that, um, that you wanted as much reach with your bayonet as possible. And the French, for example, went with a really long bayonet and a long rifle and got lots of reach. But then it was found that actually in trench warfare or even in buildings or stuff like this, any kind of confined space, this was actually uh, disadvantageous because obviously in an open field, if we're bayonet fighting, having more reach is a good thing, generally speaking. Um, but if you're jumping in and out of trenches and scrambling around, then actually a shorter weapon is, is, is better in that, in that scenario, in that context. So, um, uh, so this bayonet was actually, uh, it was used still in the First World War, but simply because there were lots of them around. Um, but uh, as this rifle was also used in the Second World War. But, um, they did start using shorter bayonets again because they realised, you know, in modern warfare you don't really need that length of blade, generally speaking. Um, but, uh, is, is it more comfortable to use a blade in the centre? Yes, I would say absolute, absolutely it is, but usually it is only possible to get a bayonet that's really in line with the barrel. Can be mounted top, bottom, side, whatever, but close to the barrel and in line with the barrel. It's only really possible with breech loaders. Um, now, um, bayonet versus bayonet, which would I rather have in a one-on-one -on -one fight? Well, obviously it depends on the context. If I was in an enclosed space, I'd pick this one, and if I was in an open space, I'd pick this one. I do generally think that um, in most situations, the longer um, weapon is, is going to be advantageous because, of course, you can strike your opponent from further away before they can strike you. To an extent, this means you can even do stop thrusts. So if, if you're there with your... Um, you're there with your bayonet and they come in and launch a thrust at you. If you know that you have the longer weapon, if you can see it's the longer weapon, you can actually stab them with your weapon, bam, before they can reach you. But there's always an inherent danger with that in that their body, you might stab them and kill them ultimately, but in the process of them dying, they might come right up there and then be able to reach you with their bayonet. So that's even a bit risky in itself. I would always prefer to cover the line, knock their weapon offside, before then putting my own weapon in. Um, 
In terms of the butt, I would say having, having a shorter weapon definitely makes it quicker and easier to bring the butt in from any kind of direction. In terms of some people might ask about cutting, is it possible to cut with this type of bayonet? I would say yes it is. Um, Hutton covers this in his manuals where he's talking about the Yatagan bayonet and the later um, shorter, the sword bayonet, but that was shorter than this. And uh, his basic advice is you never open with a cut because the moment of, if you start with your point online, the moment you lift your point up, you can be hit by a stop thrust. So, but generally speaking, if someone thrusts at you and you go parry, now your edge is up. And at that point, you could come back with a cut or parry, cut. And this is the same shown in the earlier um, 1860s French bayonet um, manual for use of the Chaspeau Yatagan bayonet as well. So indeed you can cover and if you come off line to cover then indeed you can come back with a cut. So yes you could cut with this. Cuts are not going to be hugely offensive um, but I would say if you cut someone on the head or neck or even one of their arms or hands you will wound them slightly, it will certainly hurt and having done that, that might enable you to then get your points into them. But yes, short weapons it is quicker to turn them around but of course you don't have the reach and the other thing I would say is the longer weapon, although it takes longer to turn around, it does mean that even with the back end, you can potentially reach further than you can with the shorter weapon. Um, so I would, in close combat, prefer this over this. One final thing to say is that, um, I'll use the SMLE to display this, well, actually I'll use both. The Enfield musket, one of the disadvantages of having a bayonet attached to your barrel is that indeed, you can bend the barrel, and this actually happened. Um, even, with, even with the large barrels of the 19th century, they noticed, for example, the two-band uh, two Enfield musket um, with the long sword bayonet. Sometimes the leverage was enough that if they did bayonet practice with it, and then they went shooting, they noticed it had become completely inaccurate because it would sometimes get a very slight bend in the barrel. So it actually changed how it was mounted. Ultimately, in Britain, that culminated in this arrangement, whereby you'll notice that the bayonet is on a lug there and there, and is not connected to the barrel. So in this case, if any motion or bending or damage or anything else happens, it only affects that nose piece and potentially this piece down here. It doesn't affect the gun barrel and it doesn't affect your accuracy. So there's a few more things about bayonets for you to mull over. I'm sure I'll be talking more about them in future. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon, or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.